It's an intelligent looking group, so I think we should get started here. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the uh, Law School for Services sponsored event on careers in intellectual property law. And we're delighted to have with us uh, three prominent local lawyers who work in the field of intellectual property law, including Jennifer Sanders, who is the senior uh, counsel of business and legal affairs at Nickelodeon Kids and Family Games Group, which sounds like a lot of fun. I want to hear more about that. And uh, Eric Gelwitz, who is an associate at the uh, uh, IP Boutique Owen Wickersham, and Erickson, and a, law, a recent alum of Golden Gate's uh, IP Law Program. And Joe Mex, who is a partner at Squire Sanders, a litigation partner at Squire Sanders, who's also a Golden Gate alum. So delighted to have you three here. And the format is I'm just going to help facilitate this by asking a couple of questions that I'm really curious about. Uh, and then we'll get the discussion going on from each of these individuals. And then I think we're going to leave plenty of time for you to ask the kinds of questions you want to ask, or the actual questions, not just the kinds of questions you want to ask. And there's a bonus, so there's an incentive to get uh, an IP center, an intellectual property law center official pen to the best questions. So I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there is some. Yeah, so Jordan, how about I welcome him for our guests? And we'll Somebody who is a uh, 
science major, political science. Uh, that's a little bit <laughs> hard, hard to break into. Uh, you know. <laughs> I found, I found myself doing it because some of the, the people at my firm perceived me rightly or wrongly to be technically savvy when I joined. It was probably because I was you know, one, of the, one of the new associates who happened to know something about computers, even though I didn't own a laptop. So. You're right, I am going to ask how you get into it. But, um, um, because I think when, I, when you speak to lawyers, you speak to most lawyers, when you ask them you know, about their, how they get, got into their current practice, the story isn't, oh, I got the certificate in this field and I, I knew exactly what I wanted to get into. It's, I kind of fell into it. So I, I'd like to hear your individual story. How did you get into IT? It's, it's, it is the sexiest area of contemporary law, by the way. It's, uh, it is fun, it's interesting, uh, it's a lot of good issues. So, yeah, how did you get into this story? Um, good point. Uh, it is the sexiest area, and I will comment on it, but it's also an extremely broad area. And also, when I go to the firm website, I'm checking the firm for the higher limit. Perfectionists or you know experts um, don't like that because I actually do need an expert. But um, I actually came out doing environmental law. I was a Berkeley for environmental law and practiced environmental law. And um, at Berkeley, which of course had a lot of practices. But um, a good lesson there was when I got into practice at it, I clearly didn't do enough research ahead of time like this or you know networking or internship. Or anything else, it's like tax law, it's horrible. But luckily, at a big firm, um, I'm not familiar with the IP group, which was highly specific and pretty hard to get into at that point. But I was able to get into the general business litigation group, which housed one of the IP groups. And that's how I got into it. I started with trademarks, and um, one of the premier attorneys who just acquired a boutique trademark firm at that point. So I got licensing experience, which at that point, so that was 18 years ago for me, let me build licensing and IP and probably got into the next step which was I think Sun and copyright and software licensing. But uh, yeah, so it was not a direct target. I think it's I think it's most difficult for for many of the attorneys, except for Eric who has a different story. Yeah, I guess that would be the case people want. Um, I knew going into law school, even before law school, that I wanted to work in IP in downtown San Francisco. So I had a very specific target. Um, I got into it because I worked in college radio at UCSB, and they had the, the programming assistants, which are essentially the students who like new music, um, working with the contracts and working with the artists and putting on events in the city of Santa Barbara on campus. And we just had a manager at No Legal Training who had us looking over um, the contracts and the agreements with the various artists that were coming on campus, or if we were getting clearance for certain things. Um, College radio is, you know, a very fly by the seat of the pants kind of operation, and I just learned that I like this stuff, and there was a way that I could incorporate my personal interests in music and entertainment and media and online content and all that that was developing at the time with the Napster and the online cases. Um, I would be happy in my career if that was something that I could just, you know, turn into the personal professional crossover. Um, it wasn't until I found that strong interest that I was. You know, you're really considering law school, and then I said, look, if I can make this work, then I'm going to be happy. And that's what I did. So going into school, I was seeking out every IP class that I could find, and this seemed to be a good place since I wanted to be in the San Francisco area working in IP. That's what I do now. Worked out. <laughs> you are then. What's your story? Can I see you? Uh, when I was in law school, I was actually the Lexus representative. Um, I don't even know they have those anymore, but back then, the, there was a little room downstairs in the library that was the Lexus room. And you could go in there and you could ask the Lexus rep to help you do research. And I just happened to be really good at doing online research. So one of the things when I joined my firm, I was a summer associate, and I got a, a gig as a full-time associate. You know, all the associates would come to me and help, ask me to help them do research because they knew I knew Lexus really well. So it got around like I was saying that I was supposedly really technically savvy. Um, so people started staffing me on these technical cases, you know, cases that involve computers or patents or whatever, copyrights, software patents, uh, things like that. And uh, over time, you just start to grow into it. Uh, um, you know, but I don't think IP is particularly more difficult than any other area. I think patent law is an area that you, before you 
go out and try to practice it, probably on a really few cases. But um, it's not like it's a particularly difficult area. But once you have that specialty and you have that knowledge, that expertise, I don't think it's any more difficult than any other area of the law. And right now, I think it's actually one of the things that, like Bill was saying, in a very, very kind of sexy area to be in, and, uh, and and a lot of fun too. Because I think that one of the things about being a litigator is you run across a lot of, you know, I don't want to say low life uh, attorneys out there who are also litigators. But I think the area of IP litigation, generally speaking, have a pretty high class of people who are litigating against, and so you have. A, you can have a nice professional relationship with the people who are on the other side. Usually, not always, but usually it's it's a very cordial relationship. That's one of the things I really like about doing this. It's a high level, I mean, except for the New York work. Excuse me, <laughs> except for the New York and some of the LA work. Right, yeah, you know, it, again, it always depends on the, the case and how hard fought it is and how much personal investment somebody has in the case. It's very emotional, but, you know, the guys trying to go to the attorneys and not want the emotion. It's not certainly right. And in IP law, I think that you get less of that. It's but you get less of that. And so, I mean, the idea of intellectual, I mean, it sounds good. Intellectual property, oh, yeah, it sounds great. You know, I mean, what the heck is it? It's kind of like any other area of the law. There's some statutes, there's some common law. Um, if you want to do it, great. Um, but it's not quite, in, in reality, not that much more sexy than probably a lot of other things. But uh, at the same time, um, um, it does have some benefits. You just burst the bubble here on the IP uh, set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're here to hear the truth, so that's, that's good. Your truth, at least, so that's good. Well, since you're talking about you know what the realities are in, in IP practice, what do you think? I'd like to hear what you think about what is it that law students in the 21st century who are interested in doing IP and IP-related uh, you know legal work? What do you think they should be doing as law students? What skills do they need? Compound question: What skills do they need, and what should they be doing as law students to, to be good IP practitioners to have the best chance to be IP practitioners? I think there's something you're pointing out. I mean, I came on the same time as you, and I was not tech savvy, and so that stuff really helped. Because when we had litigation, we had you know, like, what the hell is that is? Like, no, no, kids, you know, um, and that more background, having that uh, understanding of who we're dealing with, um, with talent, and those are it's a whole. And that's why I do it now. So it's very different than I did in the past, um, which was, you know, massive software licenses for Oracle or somebody where they're customer facing and they're going to get data. So, um, and that has a, a very different option of the IQ licensing. So my deal is to kind of get to know the content area, the subject area that you want to be in. I mean, these things are, you know, you're supposed to learn online and also very different from our past. Um, if you want to be in engineering, that helps, especially with the you know, the bigger software that's going to be differentiated, or you can take those classes and the class of software for them well, and you know what the software is. Um, or, you know, <coughs> and um, we talked about this before, and networking. I mean, honestly, it's just getting out there and talking to people and then being able to hold that conversation. And that's what the skill and something to do. I think staying very current on what's happening now, now in IP law, for instance, um, a lot of people will hear probably don't Pinterest, um, but a lot of partners and firms are not necessarily be savvy on what the ins and outs of Pinterest are can be. All this goes for a lot of social networking, and there's a lot of privacy issues that are going on with Facebook. And if you can sort of serve as as a junior associate, um, as a funnel for that information coming in, and just staying up to date, whether it be via uh, Tech Dirt, a great website for finding out new uh, trademark copyright cases um, or patents as well. But and then be able to translate that into you know an attorney meeting or um, you know work it into an email. Hey, to the rest of the uh, uh, attorneys, is saying, hey, this is something that we should pay attention to. If a client mentions this, I've been reading up on it. Come to me. And then you sort of create your own you know little spaces where you have. Uh, I mean, limited expertise, but you know, might know more than somebody that's more senior to you simply because you're staying current on that. And I think doing that in law school and be able to take that into interviews and be able to take that into informational interviews and um, speak in a way that shows that you're not just um, doing it for the job element, but you're doing it because it's a passion of yours and it's something that is 
legitimately interesting to you. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to kind of come across as a phony. Um, no offense to anyone who's done that, but I just feel like the more information you know, the better you, you can be as an associate, the better you can be as an interviewee. And you can boost yourself up above all the other people that have the IT credentials on your resume. You can actually say, look, this is something I live, and this is something I pay attention to. Yeah, sure. Because that's actually got a lot of good points in there. One is to um, use those things. A lot of senior partners aren't going to be familiar with the technology you're talking about and the issues around it. And then the huge areas right now privacy and copyright around the users. That's a, these are going to change a lot. They're kind of disruptive. A lot of data changing around these things. Um, so it's one to use the technology so that you're actually familiar with it and then be aware of the legal issues around it. When we use any of this stuff, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, any of that, if you have to set up a separate account that represents your legal persona, do that because when the law firms or anybody else looks at you, they're going to search those those sites. They have people that have those professional searches. And if you're coming up with a bunch of garbage in your stuff or social stuff mixed with legal stuff mixed with something else, you're not going to stand out. If you have, um, you know, find a few blogs that you like to follow <coughs> and you can retweet in the IP area. I mean, I did that just as an experiment. I did a bunch of people following me that I have no idea they are. I wasn't great, but just to have that to even show in interviews, and actually you might end up with somebody interested in following you or be able to develop a relationship with that person. You don't need to be a few blogs or practitioners to do that. And, and be very careful about what you are doing on those sites because they will look at you. And, it's just, and it takes 10 minutes every morning to do this digest and have to move off of it. So. Well, just one last real quick thing. Um, the tech and startup community is extremely social, so going on through networking component, you can meet a lot of people really fast, just in Soma, down in Silicon Valley, because they're out there meeting people, meeting VCs, and you know, if you can sort of talk a language and get to know these people, you can build your network really quickly. And they're all on social media, unlike some of the legal community where it's hard to track people down. And that's not to say that you should focus on legal focused events and studying up and getting the best grades possible, but I think um, you know, sort of merging yourself in the potential client pool and getting out and meeting those people and just interacting is a good way to, you know, Every single one of my jobs has come from a personal contact, every single one. And, and they are jobs where finally people apply, and I just, I think about five people in these days are a personal contact, they don't really like So, meeting someone at lunch or meeting some, you know, five years later, Um, well, everything they said. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that as you're sitting here today, is that IP lawyers are business lawyers. If you're, you're going to be helping business people solve business problems. They don't come to you because they have some kind of obscure question about whether or not something is fair use and, you know, is it, would it be okay if I posted a picture of my daughter on, you know, Facebook or something? dancing to a, a, a Prince tune, whatever that case was that came out a few years ago. They're going to come to you with real life business problems saying, can I do this? Is it okay if I do this deal? What happens if I do this? So to know business, to know the context in which these kinds of questions come up, make it a lot easier for you to give practical advice. Because what, what business people want to know is what to do. They don't want to know what the law necessarily is. Now you need to know it, and you may need to walk through it all. You may need to write a memo out to file to make sure you did it right and remember it later. <coughs> but what they want to know is, what should I do? And if you can't answer that question in a context that makes sense to them, then you're going to be perceived as useless. And they won't come back and ask you more. They'll go to somebody else. And so I think that's the most important thing to remember is right now, take the classes, be a, be a generalist to some degree in law school, Take the classes that help you learn about things like finance and tax and the things that don't necessarily sound like they're IP related. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the best classes I ever took was secure transactions. Why well, I got no basis in that. I knew nothing about finance. After going through that class, it really helped me kind of get my head around about what people do when they you know, sell, buy and sell goods, or you know, the differences between the sale of goods and licenses, things like that, that you kind of have to get your head around. Um, and it wasn't taking trademark law or patent law or whatever. But really, it's in your extra hours, it's trying to understand kind of how the business works 
And right now, it seems to me that in this area, especially if you want to stay here, um, where the businesses are is they're in the online space. Everybody's in the online space now. And so there's going to be a lot of questions about how things work online, what can you do online, you know, all the things about, you know, you know there's companies like Pinterest or whatever who are going to have these interesting IP questions. But even more generally, if you're representing a pipe manufacturer from the Midwest, you know, and they're selling pipes on the internet, you know, what kinds of issues come up from there? What if, you know, they want to advertise to somebody? There's all those kinds of things. So kind of having that general overview of kind of how modern commerce works, I think is critical. And I think you hear a lot of you talk to a lot of lawyers, especially in-house counsel, when they talk about what they want from their lawyers, they say, I'm not a problem solver. I don't need people to, you know, hiring outside counsel is expensive. We want somebody to solve our problems. Who knows our business? I don't want to have to teach them about the business. It resonates a lot with what you hear from lots of lawyers. And I'm going to plug in for Eric, just by the way. He was being very modest. He used the pin, you know, know the current technologies, be up on the field. Uh, I'll give you the anecdote for Pinterest. And the anecdote was like two months ago, three months ago, I got a phone call from a woman in house counsel at a small company, medium sized company, who asked me if I knew anybody who um, knew about Pinterest and uh, the IP issues because they were dealing with it that day. And she's the sole in house counsel of the company. She's a go to person. And she didn't know. It's so recent, it's so <coughs> developing. And I didn't call Eric, by the way. I actually called his uh, a partner at Eric's firm. And he says, Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think I know what Pinterest is. And he says, Guess what? Eric just yesterday or just last week gave a presentation at the firm on the IP issues in Pinterest. Why don't we bring him in on this discussion? And I think you guys had contacted the, uh, the, 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 the in house counsel. So it was going to literally was. He was the go-to guy. Nobody else in his firm knew it. I sure didn't know it. Um, and it really was not even a Pinterest expert that made it right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> before we move on, before we move on, is anybody in here who sees themselves being a patent prosecutor someday? Got a science background? Okay, different course for you. Um, you know, you, you certainly you should know about business, et cetera, et cetera. But really focusing, making sure you know patent law really well. You got it's hard to break in as a brand new patent prosecutor. Once you've got a couple of years of experience, you're, you almost write your own ticket. Not quite that, not quite, but almost. There's still a need for patent prosecutors out there. Patent prosecutors who are in a field like computer science or in computer engineering or in biotech, there are a lot of opportunities. But you, what you really, breaking into that area requires you to be able to be on the ground and running. So not only do you have to know prosecution, procedure very well, but you really need to know your area too. So I know people who get out of law school who are computer science majors or physics majors, um, and they really have no discipline. It's hard for them to step in to a, um, a patent prosecution practice and add value. Um, so sharpen your skills in your area of discipline. And if you have an area of discipline like physics or chemistry, make sure you kind of try to focus on something that you know really well and focus on. Before we move on, I completely agree with you. If I, uh, that's why my boss and I are where we are, is because we're business attorneys. And any deal that we do, pretty much any action we take involves a risk. You might see that in front of the Wall Street Journal, something we did. It's all legal. Everything we do, we're, we're always well within the legal boundaries, but it's the PR issues. And so we want to know what the risk is. Or in any deal, we want to know what's the risk, what we're going to do, and there's some risk we're going to be asking. Come to us. And what I want is someone who can look at the business issues. And I actually did not find that in law school. Uh, it was for my first law firm, we were not allowed to advise on business issues. We told them where the loss is, and they'd have to figure out the business. I could tell Chevron, you cannot, you know, blue gives a $6 million fine. Now, I personally know they will never find out if you drop one drop of oil in the desert, but I can't tell you that. What's the likelihood of enforcement? And that was the business nexus they were looking for. So similarly, now the world's different. There's a lot more attorneys out there. There's a lot in this area. And so reading the Wall Street Journal or anything else that keeps you up on where areas are going is giving you a broader business background of kind of where things are looking. And then <clears throat> to your point, following this current technology, because this we have such a, um, it's all happening right here, right now. And there's going to be so much change that you really do have an opportunity to be experts who are very good on something that some attorneys aren't really familiar with. And if the law changes, that would be very valuable. Okay. 
to hear your thoughts on how the building uh, on what we were discussing before and what you also mentioned about both networking and externships. How do you, be, as a law student and as a new lawyer, how do you be effective in, in your networking or as a, I guess as a law student trying to figure out how to get externships that would actually help you develop your business judgment, business skills, legal skills? And, uh, did you have any internships as a, as a law student? <coughs> I just did a similar associate thing. Okay. But um, right now, I would look at the different organizations that we just talked about. Uh, Calvar, I'm on the board of the Association of Corporate Counsel, which is a little over 2,000 in house counsel here in the San Francisco and Palo Alto area. And um, we actually have a big event coming up, so I brought flyers on that for the volunteers. And that would be great. It's, we have over 400 in house attorneys during the day. It's a long day. But um, it's a good place for you to volunteer. You'll have some exposure to attorneys and to topics and we did watch the presentations and everything. But I would find these organizations and see if they have student arms, which they tend to do, um, and also connect with individual people when we do that. You know, you know, they have to you know, really explain that stuff. You never know where that makes legal come from. What is networking? I mean, maybe in that context, student goes to volunteer for something like this. It's a great opportunity to see other lawyers, meet other lawyers. What should they do? You know, I'm going to give you a good example on that. So I just was at a lunch last week. Um, the Women in IT Law, it's an annual that we might do a little paper. It's a little bit of an opportunity. They're powerful. That is an exceptional lunch. And I ran into an old colleague from about 10 years ago. And she is a patent prosecutor. So she now owns patents for her career. And she's that great. She's like, Jen, I'm not like you. I don't like that. I do not like schmoozing. I do not like this stuff. I just like, you know, I've met some cool people, and now I go to lunch with them, and we started this group. And I was like, that's networking. Networking is whatever you can do to connect with people. And whether for me it tends to be more of a personal thing, or we'll talk about, uh, you know, you might start with law or whatever the hook is. My boss, our connection was restaurants. She was a 16, and I like food. That's the topic that happened at lunch that day, and that's what kept me in the running for the job I am on the entire planet applied for. So it's just, it's, Developing a personal connection with people and kind of, I mean, be focused on who you're talking to. I would, I'm strategic about it. I don't waste a ton of time on people who I don't personally see value if, if it's a networking event. However, you never know. You absolutely never know. So, also, just be careful about that. You can a lot of people and follow up. It's kind of falling into that stuff, and you can just shoot them your earlier comments. Like, we're all doing now. If I've met people I want to stay in touch with, had any conversation with them about their card, I'll shoot them something the next day or within a day or two that's timely. Either mentioning something we talked about at the lunch, which could be a great hearing about your kid, or um, something that I think is relevant in law. I don't have something with a pay got to see this case in the new right now. Um, just suddenly to ping them, and it, it may, we may not stay in touch, but we'll run into each other in six months and we'll have that. Oh, yeah, we've never done that before. And it's, it's whatever you want to do. We were talking about our firm and I called you and asked you questions. Um, that's the other one. Is, uh, this was at a women last ceilings conference, and the two of them that spoke were like some of the now managing partners of very big law firms, which is not something now when I was younger. But they said that men are much better at reaching out and asking for help. They seem to have been trained in that area. I think it's just appropriate to call and ask anybody, you know, can I talk to you about my career? Can I do this? And they said women actually don't have that same skill set or understanding. So to realize that you can't, people are happy to help. Like we had a GC in the in there. She said, you know, my friend's block party friend's daughter called, and of course I talked to her. You know, I just felt that's what you do. That was the kind of never asked that. You know, just that you know, tangential relationship. But to, to use that, people, it's flattering to them. They say no, they say no, so I want to. What tips do you have on networking for law school? Well, going back to how you started the question, I'd two paid internships and an externship while in school. And two of them were for over eight months, and the, the two paid ones, which is nice. But all three of the positions were through connections, one of which was a professor. Um, and the other two were, one, I met a person at a network event, and they were just completely bombarded by uh, an insurance case that was related to uh, music. We shared an interest in music. They said, well, can you come in for an interview the next day? The senior partner basically didn't know I was interviewing. He said, here, here's a whole bunch of stuff for you to do. And I was like, well, are we interviewing? And he's like, no, you already have a job. We need people that bad. He took one of the other partner's word for it that I was going to 
show up and hit the ground running, and you just said, all right, whatever, you know. They just needed people, and it was the right time, right place kind of thing. It was actually down in the mission connected with the Stanford Fair Use Project. It was a film on debating, uh, speed debating. And I just happened to go see it because there was like a flyer in the newspaper or something, so it sounded interesting. And there, the room was packed with attorneys, <coughs> and I mean, I, I just happened to be the one that was looking for someone that day or that week to jump on a case. I ended up working there for uh, eight plus months, which was really nice. And they're great people, I still stay in touch with them. But I guess the moral of the story is that you can meet somebody to the points that they've made, also that they can be your you know, potential employer, they can be a potential client, you never know. But if you don't follow up and engage in the conversation that is worthwhile, then you, you're never gonna find out. You might miss an opportunity. So I think networking, um, for me, is just building that um, web of connection. And the more people you can meet who act as, to use a non-compatible term, connectors for you, then you're just gonna have an exponentially further reach than you would uh, acting independently. Because those people are gonna go and tell somebody else that, oh, this person might be looking for a job, or this person's interested in this. Or I heard about you know, this subject matter, like interest from this junior associate. And it just like expands from there. So, um, I mean, networking, it, it sounds redundant to say networking is just about building your network, but it re really is building about that sort of web of connection because your reach can only be so far as one person, but when you have a whole bunch of people working for you, or you know, thinking about your interests when they're talking to somebody else, then you never know what's gonna happen to come out of it. It could be a job. That's you know, what everybody's ultimately looking for. So, Joe, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, um, I think those are all really great ideas. The only thing I would add to that in terms of networking is who do you know now, and who do you want to stay in touch with? Um, who did you know in college? Um, who, you know, it's, it's really, it's unfortunate. And I look back at my own self in, in law school and college, and there were lots of people. I mean, now it's easier because you have things like Facebook or whatever, where you're kind of able to keep track of people where they are. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's harder because, you know, they're sitting there on, as a contact on your Facebook, and I mean, it feels a little weird. It's been 10 years. You know, yeah, I do. I think you have to make an effort to stay in touch with people who you've been friends with. You know, believe it or not, I mean, you may seem sitting here now that that's really easy, but you put 25 years in, and they, you've met a lot of people and become friends with people, and for whatever reason, drifted away. And you just have to make that effort to stay in touch with people that you've met over the years, um, because it's so easy to find yourself 10 years later saying, "God, you know." That person's the GC of what now? God, I'm glad I stayed in touch. <laughs> Maybe they would hire me. <laughs> well, on that, I was going to say LinkedIn, you guys should all have strong LinkedIn profiles, and LinkedIn, to tie those two together, is a great resource. And actually, they have a lot of discussion forums in LinkedIn. Um, and you can start following those and maybe participating at some point. And that is going to give you access to a bunch of attorneys who are here. Here right now, talking about the issues, and so you don't even have to figure it out. You know, there's anything you or questioning, like some of them that I look, look at, I'm like, oh, they're asking, you know, that, these are the types of questions that are coming up, so this is where you can start looking at what's relevant right now, or what people are saying about it. And there's a couple of different forums like this, that they, uh, but, link, you know, LinkedIn is a good start, and look at, you know, IP lawyers, or digital media lawyers, or something, and just join that discussion group, and you don't have to read that every day, that you do read some blogs every day, but, um, or, you know, sites, but, um, it's a way to get you in, and that's just starting a network right there. That's a good point. And can I highlight a point that you made earlier, Jennifer, as well, about if you're using LinkedIn is safe as it's a professional network and people get the rules. Um, uh, Facebook, you were saying maybe you have a separate professional Facebook. Can I reinforce? Yes, absolutely, positively do that. Why? Because I actually use my Facebook as a LinkedIn page. I don't put personal stuff for the most part. I use it as a professional site about the program, about the law, because I don't want you to know anything about my personal life, because I have students who are my Facebook friends, and I, I want to keep a you know, line and next students. And so it's interesting. I, I'm really happy when people um, um, drink a lot and have a healthy sex life, but you know, <laughs> I'm not really glad for you, but I shouldn't know that. By, I'm not knowing this room, but I shouldn't know that. And I wouldn't hire you if I know that information about you. It really is it's shocking that it's really, oh, it's really interesting. I, I know too much. And 
<laughs> you understand your professional judgment is just, there's, there's no way I would ever hire you as an attorney when you make that phone call. I wouldn't even, the best I would do is not bad mouth people to other people, I might just hold my tongue, that's the best you'd ever get. But really it's critically important, it's so easy to forget that, and law students and ex-law students I've seen. We're going to do your best thing here in two hours by a cat. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that I look at yeah. and go, I don't know what's wrong with this person, but I'm not going to take time to figure it out. You know, so, it, and I know it's friends too, but also, and I would love to see your personal page, because clearly now we have a professional skin. But, um, but it's true, they're going to look at this stuff, and remember, this stuff is your, your future employers or future networking, they are going to look at this stuff. It's the quickest way they're going to get a snapshot of you. And anything you put out there, I don't care what your privacy settings are, or if you think you can see it, it's universe perpetuity. Anything I post up there, I know it's going to be universe perpetuity. That's the risk. And so if I put it there, I know you can be comfortable with that going out. Let's leave some time for your comments and questions of the group here. Your interesting comments and questions. Go ahead. Here's my biggest question is, um, I've talked to a number of, uh, just put in context on the post bar, so I'm waiting for my results to come over. And I've talked to a number of IP practitioners, especially in the litigation field, in soft IP, which a lot of my classmates tend to be leaning towards right now because you don't have the tech background for patent stuff. And it, it's my impression that it seems really dry at this point. I mean, every, a lot of IP, soft IP practitioners that I've been talking to say that they're hustling to try to get cases at this point because there's just not enough work for them to do it, so they have to turn to other actors and stuff like that. So, what is your take on the current market in terms of soft IP practice, litigation wise? Because it seems like copyright doesn't seem to make a lot of money, trademark is bread and butter, but there's only so much work to go around. So, take a shot at that. Uh, how's the current market for new grants? Terrible. If you didn't know that already. Um, and if you're if you're limiting your focus to just one thing, I want to be a trademark litigator. Well, God bless you. Um, but you should. My advice to you would be open yourself up to other opportunities and try to keep that as something that you want to do. So you could join a firm, right, that is mainly a business firm, and say, look, I know a lot about trademarks. Whenever trademark issues come in, Mr. Partner Guy or Ms. Partner Guy, I want to work on this. And you know, make sure that you're building that skill up and getting the legal, the legal background at the same time. Because frankly, like I said earlier, you know, with, with, with due respect to Eric, um, you know, it's, it's you know, IP litigation is just litigation. I mean, you can be doing, you know, contract litigation, you can do uh, property litigation, you're gonna get a lot of the same skills. And then when the opportunity comes up to move into another firm, or even if your firm, you, you build, you start building a practice because people see you as being the go-to person on trademark and copyright issues, then you'll have that skill. But if you just sit around waiting for the trademark job to open, it might not ever come. So what my advice is, try to get a job that's somewhat similar or in a firm that can go in that direction and then take it from there. I mean, it's like to my earlier discussion, I, mean, I, didn't, I started in more mental health, so I should tell you when I say, uh, you know, I want to go IP litigation and I would never go in with something as focused as trademark or copyright litigation. Because unless there's some reason that you're the expert in the area, which most people in law school are not, you pigeonhole yourself far too much. So, yeah, litigation is litigation, and business litigation is, that's what this stuff is, right? It's business issues. There's a licensing provision in the contract, and some indemnity that wraps around it, and a lot of the terms are business terms, and so you need to get in there and find out going into a company and doing business litigation or having that overall experience, and then litigation itself is its own um, area, knowing how to negotiate, how to do a case, do a discovery, all of that. Um, I think Eric got a term that sounds like awesome, so they do a great job with networking and everything else, but that's not the norm to get, especially in that area, but that, you know, it's got a very sexy focus area, and that's not going to be the norm scary too because I find let's say he wanted to be in IP in San Francisco in trademark copyright. I'm thinking yeah, he's stalking you. people or something. No, I have friends or friends experience and say this. I mean, I'm not sure I'll always be in San Francisco. It's not an easy market, so that's I mean, kudos. That's awesome. Well, let me let me let me throw this out there. Right now, my firm is desperate in need of a associate who has a couple of years of experience. They don't have to hire you for the IP group. I have known anything about patent law or trademark law or anything. 
as long as I have confidence that you can learn. You know, because at that point in your career, you're still a bit of a stem cell front. I mean, you can go any direction. You know, I give you the direction to sit here, you look on that law, or you can come back here over the weekend. I have some degree, though. All right, all right, exactly. I'm too good at looking to be a faculty. Okay, good, great, great. Yeah, so my wife. It's really good. So, we, we, so again, but you got to get that experience. If you can come to me and you can show, look, I've been working for two, three years at this firm. I like your firm better for X, X or Y reasons, and um, you know whatever they happen to be. And look at the things I've done along the way. And I listen to me talk like a duck, or uh, quack like a duck. You ever heard of that? If you want to be a duck, you got to learn how to quack. Listen to me quack. Um, and if I think you, gee, wow, I really like you, and I think that you can do the job, then you're going to get the job. And so. Again, getting, getting that experience under your belt. If you want to be a litigator, get a job where you're doing discovery. Get a job where you're writing motions uh, and memoranda and things that are analyzing the law and coming up with conclusions. You know? And at the same time, if you want to get into that area of IP, do the things on the side that you need to do, like we were talking about earlier. We agree on this, and it's going to be um, coming kind of when you go to the work and you're hungry to the work. I can see. Associates. Or um, the other one is someone gave me this advice when I was interviewing afterwards. It's 50 50 you can do the work, and 50 people want to do the work with you. And the litmus test for them when I came in was, but I was stuck in the basement in the South in six months of litigation with you. And you're not there so clearly, but it was, but it really is, it's broader than that. So I would, I would absolutely follow. C critical, are you like? <laughs> you know, if you're not likable, be likable at your interview. Is yourself is someone that the person wants to work with, because that's the other thing they're looking at, is I wouldn't have to train you. I have people that want to have training, no way. Like, or yes way, you're awesome. I will absolutely invest the time in you. Yeah. There's, there's so much to be said for enthusiasm at you know, the lower level. Because um, you just you see so many people, one, who are arrogant. Yeah? And you don't want to have somebody come in and tell you, how, how, how much they know about these things, but if they can talk a good game, right? But it's that likability, what people really like, who they want to work with, is the person who comes in who's really enthusiastic. I mean, with the brain itself. Yes? So, can I just have one more point on Just to hammer what we talked about before, um, the networking component. You're, it's really hard to win a cattle call, resume call nowadays. Like you're gonna get compared to hundreds of other applicants. If you're not getting out there meeting people and building those one-to-one -one connections and having a group of people that can advocate for you, then it's your your odds are really low, I think. And I mean that's just the reality of the situation. Like you said, it's a, every every time you see a, a job posted, they're getting hundreds of resumes. I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but hundreds, yeah. But if you can have somebody, like in this situation, you know, we're looking for somebody and then meet them face to face, then that's to it's a totally different game. Or, or like a LinkedIn one. So that's yeah. why if you're building that network at some point with X companies hiring, go in and check out the uh, train there and see if you can have, you know, get to somebody at that company. It doesn't have to be the hiring person or the HR person. It can be anyone at that company who can get your resume on the front desk. Something that's 
uh, really critical to have. Um, on the other hand, I mean, certainly if you got an LLM and ID and you also have some good work experience, um, you know, it can help you become a better lawyer. But I don't know that it helps you get a job. And I'm expanding on that as well. One other thing I completely agree, I've never distinguished somebody other than tax, um, some international stuff with an LLM, that's an interesting differential. If you're going into debt, you're going to be to pay for stuff, but you've got to value the big picture, which is that plus the interest of something else. So, Okay, it hurts my feelings because I'm the uh, <laughs> 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 I claim a conflict it's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my advice. And when students ask me, that's exactly my advice. My advice is if you if you're planning to get an LLM is to sit in a, a classroom for nine more classes, do not do it. It's absolutely counterproductive. If you're doing an LLM strategically because you get a scholarship and you can take a couple of classes but also do another externship and go out and do some networking and use the LLM as a leverage to write an article or do something to get you out of the community, it might work for you, but it's disastrous to spend another year not just talking to law students and not talking to the other people in the legal community. I, I just think it's ill-advised uh, uh, for, for most students except the parents because it's a different market. But uh, well, we've had students who use the LLM after the JD strategically, and they've been really successful because they've done something, they've used it as a tool. It's not saying, well, if I get some more content, I'll be more marketable. You actually, you won't. Lawyers, when you were in your first five years as a lawyer, you don't know a lot about what you're doing anyway. You'll learn the content on the job, right? Absolutely. So getting content from classes isn't going to give you that much more of an edge. But if you use it as a tool, you leverage it for something else. Go ahead. If you're interested in obtaining corporate counsel or in-house counsel position someday, what's your opinion on getting an MBA uh, as well as the JD? Um, I'd have to say similarly. I don't think I'm going to need for those um, I need to take the time out of the market during that, so we would take that advice, which is if you're working during that time, and see something you know, you kill yourself in school if you weren't during that time, yeah, it's going to help. It's going to be a little bit of a background. Once so again, just to do more support of that health, I would get out there and get a little bit of a job because it was three years, two years working up, you probably get farther. And um, one thing that I'm strongly in favor of, and, and <clears throat> most of my in-house colleagues that I talk to, I like someone who can have a firm background to start. It's just a better training guide. It's a lot more friendly. It's a lot more professional. That's what I did with them, to your point. I, I didn't know what I was doing when it came out. And the stuff you learn there, and the, it, it's grueling, but if you've been trained by these partners who've had to go through this so many times to do it exactly right, how to design a case, how to you know, structure a web, how to, you know, by web I mean I don't give it all in my web. Um, that's all stuff I've learned that I never have had experience in, and it, I think it's extremely valuable. I want that. It's kind of like having the ballet or the classical background before you go into the you know, modern jazz dance. I, I prefer firms with some firm background. So it's right. sure you know. I worked for uh, general counsel media startup down in Soma for about 11 months while in school. And I mean, I wouldn't trade that learning experience for an MBA because every day I was doing something different. So putting out fires, handling HR issues, IP issues, um, contract issues, issues with VCs, dealing with financing, um, you know, reviewing all different sorts of documents. Uh, and you're not gonna get that kind of experience than NBA. So, I mean, I think there are companies out there looking for help. I can't point to them. But if you, if you can work your way into a position where you're learning from somebody that does that every day, then I mean, you're, it's, it's a lot better than sitting in the class. I've got a slightly different take on it, but not, not terrible. Um, if you want to do what sounds like the three of us do, and MBA is useless. Um, if you, Maybe not, but for the most part. Um, if you want to get into private equity, for example, and, uh, and you can take classes on finance in, um, in your MBA program, I mean, you have to, but really focusing on finance, then that can help you break into that area because so much of the problem solving that you're doing has to, it assumes the knowledge of that already. And it's hard to, without, you know, having years of experience in finance to kind of see the context. So it gives you a little bit of context in that area. So if you want to be a finance lawyer or a private equity lawyer, 
I think it can really help you become a better lawyer and can help you succeed early on and get you opportunities. But for IP, if you came to my firm and you were applying for a job in the IP department and you had an MBA, it would, you would look no better than anybody else with just a GPA. Um, what about uh, my background in uh, water hydrology, engineering, mm -hmm. the area of water law, and um, how it relates to the election department? Well, I'll just use that one. Part of my thesis on water law. <laughs> that is one static area. Um, no, the you can answer that. Oh, hydro, hydro, <coughs> the engineering, but that is a very static area of law. You from a, from a, if you, are you, do you have a, a science degree from college? Yes, several. Yeah. Several, okay. Um, okay, well, look, I mean, if you, if what you want to become is a patent prosecutor. If you want to be a person, yeah, I mean, it's, it, not everybody has that opportunity. Now let's talk about what patent prosecutors do. For the five or six people in here who want to be patent prosecutors, I work with patent prosecutors all the time. You know, I've got four or five of them who I, give work to and they do work for me, you know, every single day. Um, patent prosecutors do is they get information from inventors and then they make a determination about whether it may be patentable or not. And then they write up the patent application, the technical specifications, the description of the invention, and the claims, and then they deal with the patent office. And they try to convince the patent office to issue a patent, right? They also do is they're also presented with sometimes new technology. Somebody has something that, gee, I've just come up with this product and I'm thinking about selling it. Can you tell me whether this uh, is, is, will infringe someone's patent? And so then you'll go off and you'll look for what we call prior art, you'll look for things that have happened in the past and what, what have people done in the past? And is this really something that's invented? Is it, is it something that's, is the patent valid? Is there infringement that's happening here? And you give opinions on that. That's essentially what patent prosecutors do. Sometimes they help with litigation. Um, is that what you want? I mean, that's a big question because it, frankly, from my perspective, it's pretty boring. Um, you know, I see a lot of people who do it and they're the kind of people who um, don't mind not, you know, the deadlines that they have are all kind of established by the patent office. Sometimes things get a little bit move, move along, but they, they're very methodical. And kind of people, you know, enjoy science and that sort of thing. Um, now, I love science too, but I like, I like being in the thick of the valley mixing it up. Um, but with your background, if you have, if, if you have very specific knowledge of, a, of an area, there may be a patent firm that has those kinds of cases. A chemistry, we do a lot of chemistry um, work. And we have a big client who's a medical device manufacturer. And there's coatings that they put on their medical devices, um, stents and things like that. They file hundreds of patents a year. So we do all that kind of work for them. But if you have a PhD in chemistry or, you know, or even a, 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 an undergrad degree in chemistry, that's the kind of work you can find yourself doing. But what you have to be able to do is not just be a good scientist. You also have to be somebody who can do the kind of work I was describing earlier. And take someone else's invention, write about it, describe it, and then convince these bureaucrats in the U.S. patent That's office. That's what I was going to go. Your comment is that it's, it's like looking into your area of law and patent prosecution might sound you know, interesting or sexy, but it's bureaucratic. And it's, you might think, oh, these people are fair or correct or it's all done, you know, or Good systematic way, it's not, you know. You don't know who these people are, and you don't be like, why did this one get issued and this one didn't? And why are they asking this dumb one? You know, I'm sorry. But it's just to make sure that's something you're willing to deal with. Because you do have finite deadlines versus, you know, litigation, which can be just a hairy and ruin your life. It's, um, but it, it depends on what you want to do. And, and I agree with the whole uh, engineering technical background and all that stuff. So that gives you a broader scope of just water One other thought is a lot of people, when they, they, they get jobs with the USPTO after law school, and that can, I wouldn't recommend staying around that place, but um, it can give you some skills that law firms are looking for. And they're opening you know, the, the Silicon Valley office in the next Right, absolutely. There should be some, some opportunities.
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely do that. Because yeah. you get in the same as tax or anywhere else, you have the inside track of how it works. And our uh, Veritas and MS and Antec, they're head of the patent area that's where we came from. So it's just, you know, you get a year or two. Once you know the system and how things work, it's not going to affect our lives. It's just more like it's other things. It's a great idea. You know, because of the timing, we should thank our guests out and we can just uh, we can mingle with them a little bit for the next class. But thank you so much for all of you.